Good morning, Mr. Macro Alf. How are you? Hey, Peter. Doing good. All nice. And you? Yeah, good. Very good. Bitcoin, as I said to you, our happiness is a derivative of the Bitcoin price. So we're uh, we're all good right now. Uh, Bitcoin's good. Football teams went in. Uh, the sun isn't shining, but we're happy. When did we last speak? Was it six months ago, Nanny? Longer? Yeah, about six months ago, I think. Yeah, so the world's just got madder since we last spoke. Why not? And it's uh, very interesting, by the way. I still have to find an asset where my mood relates to. Uh, so for you, it's Bitcoin. I have to think about mine. You don't own any Join Bitcoin? The <laughs> I can only tell you my mood goes down rapidly when somebody you know slaughters Italian cuisine traditions. That's all I can say. But I can't relate anything to mood going up to an asset price. I'll have to think about it. So if we put a pineapple on a pizza, you're going to lose your shit, are you? Yeah, pretty much. Also, never showing up on this podcast anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No no infinite pineapple pizza. Uh, God, we should dig out that video of, what's his name? The, you know the chef on the uh, this morning? Oh, uh, they, yeah, I know he you mean. Oh, something to Campo, is it? Yeah, where she makes the carbonara. Have we talked about this? I can't remember. <laughs> Oh man, you're scaring me. I'm not sure I want to see that. Can I unsee it after? Probably not. <laughs> no, you'll love it because it's an Italian man defending the honor of a uh, uh, pasta. Okay, very nice. God bless <laughs> him. Did you after. God bless him. But how have you been? Have you been good? <laughs> yeah, yeah, all good over here. The world is a bit madder. I think you're right. Um, it's also quite interesting, to be very frank with you, Peter. I mean, when I was working at the bank uh, between 20. 15 and 2019, you can say in that period particularly, there was pretty much nothing going on, really, in macro. And it was pretty boring, you know? And then politicians figured out uh, that to fight the pandemic, they could release fiscal stimulus. And then they went a bit over the top, one can say, with that, uh, especially the United States, but everywhere around the world. And, and that actually has been a very interesting change in macro conditions because I think it has also changed the perception of how politicians feel about the use of fiscal going forward. They have used it, they've generated strong growth, they've also generated inflation, but all of a sudden we are here a couple of years later and this inflation seems to be transitory and it's reverting back very calmly to 2%. So, you know, maybe if you're a policymaker, you're like, wow, this fiscal thing is very nice. I can pull it, I can make growth go to the roof. I'll get some inflation, sure. But ultimately, it seems to mean revert. So maybe they'll use it more going forward, which is a cocktail for more macro volatility, which, hey, is all I can ask for, right? Well, this is what Stephanie Kelton says, right? She says, uh, uh, it's okay to print money as long as you uh, keep inflation under control. But under control is subjective. Yeah, Is under control always under 2% or is under control, look, if it runs away, we change uh, interest rates and bring it back under control uh, and, and kind of ignore the devastating effect that it's had on so many people and the, the, the shift we always get in the, the wealth gap and the further hollow, hollowing out of the middle class. It's like, I think they, I think they know their short-term fix, but I don't think they're really appreciating the broader impact. And also the other thing is that inflation is very much an expectation phenomenon. Like as long as the expectations are somehow anchored, then inflation will revert back to acceptable levels. You know, everything is, is okay. It's doable. You can print fiscal and maybe you're going to have a strong bout of inflation upwards. But as long as inflation expectations remain anchored, policymakers can feel relatively comfortable that, you know, a predictable outcome Will, will finally prevail. But if you do this exercise two, three, four, five times, and then people start thinking, well, if you're going to do this very, very often, then maybe I should review my inflation expectations theory, right? I shouldn't expect that inflation will very quickly revert back to 2% all the time. And when you change your expectations, then it also gets reflected in bond markets. And then that means also the cost of financing for the real economy changes, the allocation of capital changes, and how you have to more productively use capital is becomes front and center. So you don't see 0% interest rates anymore because that additional volatility gets priced in bond market and people demand more compensation to own bonds. And as they do, the entire macro picture changes. So I think one time you can do it, it looks very nice. It's a, it's a uh, let's say, 
anti-cyclical reaction to uh, a recession, uh, like it was during the pandemic, or, or anyway to an exogenous event. So you do it, you react, it's anti-cyclical, it works. But now we're doing something different, I think, Peter. Now what we're doing is we are going to do fiscal deficits in any case. That's not anti-cyclical, that's pro-cyclical fiscal policy. And I, I put up a chart a couple of weeks ago, I think also on social media, where in the past, if you looked at a chart of US unemployment rate and fiscal deficits, they were pretty much uh, negatively correlated. And what I mean is when unemployment rate was going up, the US government was pushing fiscal deficits to a lower level as a percentage of GDP. So they were basically doing more fiscal when unemployment rate was going up. Okay, So that's anti-cyclical use of fiscal. The economy weakens, you use the fiscal lever. And when the economy was strengthening, you would withdraw fiscal support from the private sector. And if you look at the chart today, <laughs> unemployment rate is 4% or a bit less in the United States. And nevertheless, Biden decided to go for it again. And honestly, if Trump gets reelected, I, I don't really expect him to do anything different from that perspective. So it's not anti-cyclical, it's pro-cyclical fiscal policy. And that's a different animal, I think. How problem is the debt becoming? Because obviously they can keep doing this you know, cycle after cycle, re uh, rinse, repeat. But my understanding of, say, for example, in the US, uh, interest payments are on their debt alone is approaching a trillion dollars. And I'm going to make some numbers up here. They, they, they're going to be wrong. But but I think I know tax receipts are, say, two and a half trillion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, the, the amount of borrowing, it seems to be, is going to have to keep increasing and keep increasing. And so if they keep doing fiscal, it's going to get, it's like more of a volatile roller coaster. And uh, yeah, we hit 10% inflation, nothing I've really experienced in my life. Could it be 15 to 20 next time they do this? Could we hit 40? Could, you know, could we have what ha was happening in the likes of Turkey happen here in the UK or the US? So your question relates to what is inflation really? Yeah. And inflation is always a monetary phenomenon. As long as you know what money is, that's generally yeah. what I say. So look, um, inflation is the phenomenon of too much spendable money for the private sector against a relatively limited amount of supply you can expand. So if you, if you have too much money you can spend because it gets printed very rapidly, then unless supply can expand very rapidly to meet this demand, what you're going to have is prices going up. You're going to have rapid inflation. And now people mess it up all the time because they look at monetary aggregates like M2, for example. And an M2 can be interesting, but it's polluted by forms of money that cannot be spent in the real economy. So for instance, M2 also includes the bank deposits that PIMCO in the United States owns at JP Morgan, their depository bank, right? And if PIMCO owns more bank deposits, they're showing up in M2, but PIMCO cannot spend these bank deposits in inflationary stuff directly, right? So that's like a financial form of money. What we should focus on instead is the real spendable money, the money you and I can spend, Peter, the money corporations can spend in capex, in investments, et cetera, et cetera, because that is, of course, inflationary. And now, who is printing that money? Well, the government is when they do fiscal deficits, because fiscal deficits are basically the government blowing a hole in their balance sheets. So the government says, look, I am the issuer of the currency. I issue the dollars, right? And therefore, I will going to blow a, a hole in my balance sheet. I will make a deficit, right? And therefore, I will inject resources into the private sector. And in a normal environment, I would want to tax them back, right? At some point, I will tax the private sector to get these resources back. But as we discussed, Peter, that seems not to be happening anymore, right? What the government is doing is blowing a hole in their balance sheet repeatedly and therefore injecting new resources into the private sector pretty much on a continuous basis. So think of it like this. When the government does fiscal deficits, let's assume they cut your taxes or they send you checks at home. If you had $100,000 at the end of the year as your, as your income, and then you need to pay $30,000 taxes, all of a sudden the government says, no, Peter, it's only 10,000 taxes. This year you can keep 90K for yourself. Now, if the government keeps on doing that, your spendable amount of money in the real economy will actually go up, right? And assuming constant velocity, which is something we need to discuss as well, assuming constant velocity of this money, 
that means that the entire private sector has more spendable power. So it has more demand to put at work. And if the supply can't expand, you'll get inflation. So now you understand the role that fiscal deficits have in creating inflation. If you do them repeatedly, if you do them too aggressively, you risk generating too much demand vis-a-vis -vis supply that can't expand. And the second lever is uh, private sector credit creation, which is basically bank lending or credit in general. So when banks lend money, what they're doing is they're looking at your future income as an employee, yep. as an entrepreneur, and they're saying, look, I'm, I'm bringing forward all your future purchasing power to today through a loan or through a mortgage. So all of a sudden you have money that before you didn't have, that's the creation of credit towards the private sector. And your, your buying power goes up five, seven, 10 times compared to waiting for the next 30 years to accumulate your cash flow through salary or other means of income. So when you have too much credit or you have too much fiscal or too much of both at the same time, you are going to get inflationary bouts. And the flip side of this is that both credit and fiscal create debt. So when I say you get a mortgage, you also get debt. Not only the buying power to buy a house you couldn't afford, but you also get the mortgage attached to it. Somebody sent me a brilliant email this morning, uh, Scott Avery. Do you know Scott who's got the uh, who's always at the conferences we're at, Danny? He's got the yeah. uh, little the, the daughter. He said, uh, it says, lesson one, US tax revenue, $2.17 trillion. Fed budget, $3.8 trillion. New debt, $1.6.5 trillion. National debt, $14 trillion. Recent budget cuts, $38.5 million. Um, obviously, this is, you know, yeah, this is probably from a few years ago. It says that let's now remove eight zeros and pretend this is a household budget. Annual family income, $21,000. Money the family spent, $38,000. New debt on the credit card, $16,500. Outstanding balance on the credit card, $142,000. Total budget cut so far, $38. Now, the issue with this is that it's a very nice story, but the U.S. budget doesn't work like a household because of course. I can't print money, Peter. Like if I have that budget, I can't say to the bank, well, I'll print some ALF money and I'll, you know, I'll keep doing this and uh, you'll take my ALF money, right? Yeah. The bank will be like, no, I won't take that. The U.S. can say, I'll print new dollars. I'll do more fiscal deficits. I'll blow another hole in my balance sheet. Will you take the dollars? And the answer is so far, yes. The market is saying, yes, I'll take your dollars. That's fine. So we need to think of, to talk about that because let me make an example when the market said, no, I'm not going to take your currency. It's a very recent example. And we have to only go back to October, 2022. And we have to go to the United Kingdom. So the UK had inflation at about 10%. And then Liz mm -hmm. Truss thought that she could make an expansionary budget in which she would cut taxes and make, you know, basically inject more resources into the private sector with inflation already at 10%. So she wanted to go for large fiscal deficits when inflation was already high. And there the bond market said, nope. I'm sorry, I won't take your sterling, uh, your newly created sterling, basically. I won't take them down very easily under this condition. So what happens in that case is that the so-called bond vigilantes show up. And hear me out. What happens at that point is two things. The market says, well, you have inflation at 10%. You want to make more fiscal deficits. You want to issue more gilts. This is, this is the UK government bonds. And then the market says, yeah, I'll buy them, but I need a premium in two forms. I need higher long-end interest rates, which means I need to get rewarded more for taking this risk right now. B, I'm also going to devalue your currency at the same time. So basically, I'm going to take your assets, but the sterling has to be way cheaper than it is today, and interest rates have to be higher at the same time, particularly at the long end of the curve. So the market demands premium to take down these assets because it understands this really can go on forever. And then people have asked me, so what happened then is that Liz Truss basically had to resign. At the end of the day, she was thrown out. And then uh, we had basically a pension crisis and the Bank of England had to set up facilities so that UK pensions could be solvent at the end of the day. So they could post these bonds, which were going down in value and they could get liquidity back from the central bank. A whole thingy until it got under control. But most importantly, Liz Truss was not there anymore. So the budget was not that expansionary at all at the end of the day. And politicians had to revert back to a more, you know, 
orthodox stance when inflation is already at 10%. The question about the US now, right? So let's try to think, can this happen in the United States? Has it happened so far? No, not at all. Because today interest rates have moved higher, that's correct, but that's mostly a reflection of the Federal Reserve hiking cycle. So if you look at the, at the yield curve in bond markets, most of the, of the rise in interest rates is at the front end of the curve two-year, five-year bonds, and the curve remains inverted still up to today. So that means this premium that investors should be requiring, not trusting the United States anymore, like it happened in the United Kingdom, should be at the long end, and it's not happening. It's not there yet. And the second point is the dollar is actually stronger against other currencies, not weaker, like it happened to the sterling. So the bond vigilantes are not in action in the United States. Why the hell is that? If the US keeps printing fiscal deficits like the numbers you just said before, and they did so even last year when inflation was still 5 and 6%, and the answer is the structure of our monetary system demands people to absorb US collateral. It's almost a requirement of the system, the way we have built it, okay? And for the system to implode, so the de dollarization we often hear about, right? This, for this de-dollarization to take place, things have to get, interestingly, first so bad, and this, this first instance favors the dollar, and I can explain why in a second, and when you reach that tipping point, then you can have a change of system. It's a bit of a complicated thing, but we need to talk about the monetary system to understand how this works. So, think with me now. So, what we did... Uh, basically involves all countries in the world invoicing, selling their goods, selling their commodities. Anything they do today is about 70% denominated in dollars. It's huge. So I always make the example. Say you are a Brazilian firm and you sell soybeans. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in Brazil. Um, your buyer might be any other country around you. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. Let's assume the buyer is China today, just for the sake of it. Okay, so China wants your soybeans. Now, funnily enough, the way we have built the system, Brazil will sell soybeans to China in dollars. So Brazil will say, uh, sorry, your remimbi, uh, uh, I mean, you guys don't have rule of law. Uh, you have capital controls in China. Uh, what can I do with this remimbi? Like, you know, I sell your soybeans, I get the remimbi. And then what? Like, where do I invest them? Back in China? But then if you put capital controls, I can never get my renminbi back, right? It doesn't sound very smart. So why don't we agree on dollars, okay? That, that's what Brazil says. So then China says, okay, I need your soybeans. Here is the dollars. So now dollars have entered the Brazilian banking system, okay? So the Brazilian corporate receives dollars and then it parks them at some Brazilian bank, basically, okay? So the dollars have entered the Brazilian banking system and ultimately, the Brazilian bank um, either parks them at the central bank or has a facility with the central bank or needs to invest them somewhere. They have these dollars, they will invest them somewhere, right? And what is this somewhere? If your country, Brazil, keeps exporting, so growth is fine, it's all nice and dandy, and Brazil grows and grows, there will be more dollars in the system, in the banking system in Brazil. So then what's going to happen? This Brazilian bank or this Brazilian corporate or the central bank will need to invest these dollars into some place to keep them safe somewhere, okay? And what is that? Today, it's treasuries. Why is that? Because treasuries are extremely liquid. The fact that the debt goes up, up, and up over time, actually, if you think about it, Peter, it facilitates the liquidity of the market. It becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger market over time, which yeah. means it's even more liquid. You know, It's a gigantic pool as a market where everybody swims in. And so what you understand here is that when the treasury issues new bonds, Every other country in the world that has some activity exporting some goods or some services has dollars to put at work somewhere. And we have created a system where these dollars are then recycled back into treasuries because these treasuries are, especially the, the short dated ones, the T-bills, you know, the part, the closer part on the curve, they don't have a lot of interest rate risk. They're very short dated bonds. They are issued by Again, the issuer of the reserve currency of the world, which is the US. So we have created a closed loop pretty much where the issuance of treasuries actually 
facilitates the growth of a liquid and bigger and deeper market where every other country in the world which is selling their goods and services in dollars will want to invest these dollars in in order to keep them in a liquid place. That's the system we have created today. That's pretty fun, isn't it? So it's good for the Americans. <laughs> yes, very good for the Americans. So what's happening is that you have China, Brazil, uh, all emerging markets, they're producing real stuff. So, you know, commodities or services or goods, and they are exporting them and they are getting dollars back, mostly dollars back. And then these dollars are recycled back into treasuries issued by the United States. That's how the system works today. Where, where can a country get in trouble with that if they don't have their balance of trade correct? Yeah, okay. So now we go to the most interesting part of this system, uh, the euro dollar system. So the euro dollar system is effectively a system by which the Brazilian corporate has found out at some point, Peter, that if they lever up their balance sheet in dollars, that's great because then they can get this dollar flowing in by borrowing dollars externally. So they don't always need to sell soybeans in dollars. They can also borrow these dollars. They figured out, right? And then they can, lo they can lever up their balance sheet in dollars, make more transactions in dollars and grow and grow and grow. So not only Brazilian corporates have found that out, but every other corporates and countries in the world have figured out that levering up their balance sheet in dollars could be beneficial. And so they've done that. By my calculations and BIS data, um, up until two years ago, there were about 12 trillion dollars of dollar denominated debt issued by non-US residents. So that would be foreign countries, that would be foreign corporates. So not only they're tying their business to the dollar on the asset side, now they're also saying, well, I want to tie my business to the dollar also on the liability side by borrowing and levering up my balance sheet in dollar. And here is the part, linking back to what I said before, for this system to really collapse, you actually need first the dollar to get stronger and effectively to suck everything to a black hole until it can implode. And how does that work? So let's say that tomorrow, Brazil, Russia, whoever, a bunch of countries would say, fuck the dollar, we are out, we don't want this anymore, okay? A bit like Russia and China has been doing recently. Yeah. But let's say a few more countries join. So it's not only a few of them, it's a large amount of participants into this euro dollar system saying, fuck the dollar, I don't want to do this anymore. There are $12 trillion of uh, debt out there issued by these guys, right? Okay, mm -hmm. So that's, that's what happens. So tomorrow, China or Brazil don't sell their goods, commodities, and services anymore in dollar. They're out of it, out. That means the organic flow of dollars for them doesn't exist anymore. So where do they get their dollars? I mean, they don't get it anymore, right? They're trying to get out. Sure. Remember, this is the asset side of the balance sheet. So the cash flows aren't coming in in dollars anymore. But then these guys have $12 trillion of liabilities on the other hand to service. So how are they going to service those without dollars coming in? They, they're not. They're simply not able to. So what would need to happen is effectively is a big, big deleveraging of the system where dollar de debt gets defaulted on pretty much, right? So right. All, all these countries, Peter, would have to say, uh, I am not a, a worthy creditor anymore. Forget about it. You can't lend me money because all of a sudden I might decide not to pay you back. So the system deleverages. And when a system compresses on itself, when a system deleverages, what happens, funnily enough, is that the denominator appreciates. The denominator goes up in value. So you basically need to compress this system like in a black hole until it finally implodes. And the risk-reward from all the parties is not particularly good, if you look at it, right? Because you need to be the first guy that goes on a limb and says, fuck the dollar, I'm out. And then you will be not seen as a worthy creditor anymore by anyone, and you will be collapsing your balance sheet, basically, and defaulting. And it's it's not a great proposition, is it? Well, so, I mean, I've essentially said fuck the dollar or the pound, and I think Danny has, because uh, we found, found this alternative, which is a uh, another highly liquid uh, global uh, reserve asset, uh, but the one we favor is a mutable peer-to-peer -peer, um, and uh, uh, independent of uh, any government's ability to print. Uh, and so we have a preference for that one. <laughs> and that's where I tend to keep my money these days. And I just wonder 
will we or are we going to gradually see more people doing the same? We know MicroStrategy's done it. We know a lot of individuals have done it. We know El Salvador's kind of doing it. Mm-hmm. I think there's a potential. For, you know, I mean, you obviously know I'm talking about Bitcoin, but like, is Bitcoin a threat to this then? So the situation is the following. If let me let me walk back and think about an alternative uh, to before I go to Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. So let's think about a very familiar asset that could easily replace this uh, system. Okay. We have already done it in the past and it used to be gold. Yeah. Okay. This used to be the asset that that was the alternative to this system at the end of the day. It wasn't the alternative. It was complementary to the system because what we did is we had dollars, we had Euro. No, we didn't have Euro back then. We had dollars, we had Deutsche Mark, we had Sterling, but the supply of fiat money was pegged against a hard asset like the dollar. So you had to ensure convertibility at a certain price, which obviously isn't possible if you print too many of these dollars, right? It doesn't work anymore. The balance isn't there. And then we went out of that system. But now let's think about it today. Um, Gold already sits on the balance sheet of all these institutions. So all these actors have already called in play, Brazil, Russia, whoever, They already have gold in their balance sheets, Peter, right? It's already there. It sits there and also to large amounts, okay? So the incentive scheme in moving from today's system to a more gold-based system or a complementary system would actually be, in some cases, even relatively favorable to some of these countries because maybe their gold reserves as a percentage of GDP or total assets is pretty large. So if they are the guys going out on a limb and few of them follow, then they will find their the asset side of the balance sheet appreciate rapidly because gold prices will go up and they will benefit from it. Remember the previous instance where you just say, fuck dollar, I go out, I choose something else. Yeah, what happens isn't necessarily nice because you suffer on on your liabilities and you really don't have an asset appreciation of anything, right? And in this Mm -hmm. case, you'll have gold going up in your balance sheet. So at least it helps, okay, from that perspective. But even that isn't happening or it is happening on the background and very, very slowly, okay? We have seen central banks getting slowly away from treasury allocation a little bit more into gold, but it's a very slow moving process. And even then, this is not happening. And let me add something else. Um, I worked in 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 a large bank and um, banks around the world, because of regulation, are forced to buy something around 10 to 15 trillion dollars equivalent of so-called high quality liquid assets. So this is a regulation that was put in place after 2008, 2009, because we found out that banks had no liquid assets really. So if all depositors came all at once trying to ask for money, yeah, then banks really didn't have the liquidity, the liquid assets to repo or sell to service these deposit outflows if these outflows were all concentrated. So the regulator said, no, nah, that's not great. So you got to own a large percentage of your, bal- well, a 15% roughly percentage of your balance sheet in high quality liquid assets. You want to guess with me what the regulator said a high quality liquid asset is? Uh- I doubt they said Bitcoin, but... No, it's not. Uh, for According to the regulator, it's bonds. Wow. So again, a circular, on. Again, a circular system where we, say, where we say not only the, uh, let's say, everyone selling commodities, goods, or services has to do that in do- or does it in dollars, and therefore you have the circular system we talked about before where the dollars end up in treasuries. Now also... $15 trillion in total of global bank balance sheets have to be in liquid assets. And these liquid assets are either you know, money parked at the local central bank or guess what? Government bonds again. You want to guess with me what other assets are considered, maybe with a bit of a haircut, but still considered high quality liquid assets. Well, I can help. Index funds? No, no, that would be that would be too aggressive for a regulator. You have to think like think like a European regulator now. You know, think like a German guy. You know, a pretty pretty stiff regulation. So they figured out that um, they could buy government bonds, or if they wanted, they could buy um, supranational or agencies. So that is like semi-government institutions issuing bonds, or in some cases they can buy corporate bonds. 
oh, that's that's a bit more risky. But these corporates need to be rated by credit agencies above a certain rating. You know, there are a bunch of rules. What about equities? Nah, that's too risky. We don't want that. We don't want the balance sheet of banks to be there for liquid assets. So you can I, only buy their shit. Then I figured out when I joined the bank back then, I said, well, in Europe, interest rates were negative back then eh, when I was working at the bank. So effectively, you had 15% of your balance sheet losing money, literally. You either had to park it back at the central bank, negative interest rates, or you had to buy bonds, which are also yielding negative um, at some point. So I said, uh, what about buying some gold? Sounds relatively liquid to me as an asset, and at least it doesn't pay negative interest rates. It doesn't pay any, but zero is better than negative. Hmm. And then we figured out that, of course, the regulator said, said, no. Gold is not a high quality liquid asset. Danny, did you see the uh, Gensler video that went around yesterday? Yeah, when he was on MSNBC or CNN or whatever it was. Yeah, it kind of reminds me a little bit of that, where he was saying, well, what do you trust? And he started mm-hmm. like attacking the decentralization of Bitcoin and saying, surely you trust a centralized entity a bit more. I can't remember exactly what he said, but it has that kind of like feeling where he was selling his book. A hundred percent. It was completely political. He was basically saying Bitcoin was centralized because there's a, like only a few exchanges, I think. Yeah. Fucking, yeah. Yeah. So is the sort of growing fragmentation across the world a risk to treasuries as the sort of global reserve asset? Because like when China see Russia get their treasuries frozen, they must be like, fuck that. Let's make sure we diversify heavily. They did. I think a few of them did. I think it explains why gold prices are relatively resilient despite interest rates being in freaking 5%. I mean, if you draw a chart of real interest rates and gold, you would have expected by now gold to be at $1,300, not at $2,000. But it's still at $2,000. I think also because then a few central banks out there have decided to marginally change their allocations in favor of gold and out of treasuries. But this is just a very low percentage of, of their you know, uh, a low change in their asset allocation. It's not an extremely uh, strong one in terms of magnitude. Nevertheless, it's something that is happening. But when it comes to threatening the role of the U.S. treasuries, okay, so today we have about $13 trillion of foreign reserve assets in the world. So those are central banks that have accumulated mostly dollars by, se- by their own corporates and households, basically selling goods and services and getting paid in dollars, okay? There is about $13 trillion of those in the world. And uh, the, the data today shows that about 65 to 70% of that is still parked in treasuries, okay? Now, your question is, can that go down? Can that go down to 50 or 40 or 30, whatever? If that goes down, something else needs to go up. So, you know, there's $13 trillion, it needs to be allocated somewhere. So what's that somewhere? And that's really the hardest question because Brazil doesn't want to buy renminbi bonds or assets or Chinese stuff. And China probably doesn't want to buy Brazilian bonds either because maybe Lula shows up with something tomorrow and and maybe, uh, you know, they have a a political disaster or maybe they, they put up capital controls or whatever. And by the way, the Brazilian bond market and the Chinese bond market are way, way, way smaller and less liquid. So when China needs their money back, basically, for any liquidity reason, and they try to offload a trillion of Brazilian bonds, the market's going to blow up. So it's mm-hmm. really the alternative, which is a problem. And if, we, if you even go into, I don't know, Japan, let's use a neutral place like Japan. The Bank of Japan owns the large majority of the Japanese bond market. So also there, the free floating stuff, really the one left to trade for liquidity purposes is extremely small. So at the end of the day, when it comes to traditional assets, there is something that is not even close to an alternative to treasuries when it comes to traditional assets. And that's why you don't see that change. You only see marginal moves. Ah, the dollar allocation goes down from 70 to 65, but that's not going to be a lot more than that because the alternative is lacking amongst traditional assets. So I've got kind of two questions on that. One being, at what point does it become an existential risk to the system? Like if it's 40, 30% being allocated to US treasuries. But then also, is this not why they're trying to create BRICS? So they do have an alternative and it's not just reliant on one country. Yeah, so the, again, the BRICS story is, um, 
basically you need to ask yourself, will they trust each other? Is there a set of governance and rules that makes it so that they can trust each other with the surpluses they accumulate? They need to be invested in this so-called BRICS bonds or whatever they figure out, right? The question always comes to liquidity, regulation, governance, and depth of the market. Because if I am China and I'm accumulating foreign exchange reserves, I don't want you to fuck up with some internal politics or some rule of law or some capital controls and prevent me from being able to use these funds, right? At the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. And, uh, well, somebody smarter than me once said that in this setup, the dollar is the cleanest, dirty shit. Treasuries are the cleanest, dirty <laughs> Well, should I say shit or sheet? Well, both maybe. But it's, it's, this is how it works. And today it's very, very hard to challenge this. Go, look at Europe. I mean, Europe can't even arrange a proper centralized uh, fiscal authority. We can't arrange that in Europe because Germany thinks something. The Netherlands agrees. Italy says, nope, sorry. And France says, well, we're somewhere in the middle. We don't know actually where do we stand. So we can't even agree on a centralized fiscal facility in Europe. That is. We figured that one out in the UK. <laughs> well, the, that was indeed the outcome of that. So I'm making a story here to say that if you look at traditional assets, the alternatives are very poor. And this is pretty much undeniable at this stage. If you try to move outside of traditional assets, so then you look at gold or Bitcoin, then you face an interesting dilemma. So I said gold before, and uh, the regulators have said, nevertheless, that gold is not a high quality liquid asset. This is a sign that they're very careful with how much do they want to give away as an opportunity for institutional allocators to consider gold as an alternative. And when I hear about Bitcoin, now let's move to the topic really. Mm. So, uh, if gold is treated poorly from a regulatory standpoint for large institutional investors, Bitcoin is treated shit from that perspective by regulators, okay, at the time being. So if you work for a bank, and why am I mentioning banks or pension funds? Because they are whales. They control trillions and trillions and trillions in assets. And these are the actors that you want to look at when you say something is changing. So you shouldn't, I mean, it's important. I think it's, it's something relevant that households and retail people are looking at Bitcoin and now there is an ETF. And so these are important signs to consider, but if you want to look for a game changer, then you should look at institutionals, then you should look at these whales and see what is their incentive scheme to make a transition. So regulators are making that extremely hard for gold, not to talk about Bitcoin, just to start with. And it's basically, I think, because the incentive scheme from the people that are, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the weeds of our monetary system is that the status quo is the most comfortable outcome. Like, think of it like that. If you are in the weeds of today's monetary system, if you are a U.S. bank regulator, if you are a politician in charge of a G10 country, what is your incentive scheme? Is it to cause disruption? Is it to cause convex reaction functions? Or is it for the current system to somehow survive? It's the current system to survive, of course. Correct. So that's um, what I learned as well when talking to, to big central bankers when I was at my previous job. I would ask them, or even better, to prime minister, I would ask a former G10 prime minister, hey, we all know that your country needs this, that structural reform, okay? It's pretty obvious. So can I ask you why the heck you're not doing that? Because you have majority in the lower house and in the upper house. So what are you waiting for? And it would be like, yeah, sure, an education reform, a civil law reform, whatever you're suggesting, like, will it buy me votes? And the answer is no, it doesn't. It doesn't buy you votes. It actually buys votes for a guy coming 20 years from now that will reap the benefits of the long-term productivity announcement that the economy goes through once these reforms come in full force. But the guy has to be reelected in four years, so he's not going to go for it. Say now. Maybe there is a better alternative or a different alternative to the current monetary system, but you cannot expect the people in the weeds and in control of the current monetary system to voluntarily change it or to put up rules so that this can change easily. At that point, then you're left with really one option, which is the disruptive option, right? It's not like this is going to happen endogenously. It happens exogenously. It happens from the outside and it's a powerful force that you can't stop. 
And I have some sympathy for that. Um, as a macro investor, there are two issues. The first is the time horizon, uh, because it might as well be past my lifetime, honestly. Like, I don't know when is the tipping point and when does this happen. So it's very hard to invest solely based on this conviction because the timeline is so vague. And the second part is that I want people to understand is if you have this exogenous event that triggers this change, the first reaction is not that the dollar goes down. The first reaction is that the dollar goes up like a wrecking ball and kills everything. Mm -hmm. And the system basically implodes from within effectively because of all this leverage we have created in dollar. And this leverage in dollar is held by counterparties that are not sitting in the United States. They don't have access to dollar liquidity. So basically you are deleveraging a huge system. And what that causes is disruption the dollar appreciates like a black hole. It sucks everything from the within until we reach an unsustainable point and then it implodes. So this is an important step because people are often looking at the weakening of the dollar as a sign that something is changing. But you should think the opposite. When the dollar is weakening, think like a Brazilian corporate. Think like this. When the dollar is weakening and you have dollar debt, is that positive or negative for you? That's positive because basically you're having your liabilities go down in value. And yep. the dollar weakening is often associated with strong economic growth elsewhere. So probably Brazil is selling more soybeans, so it's getting more business done. And at the same time, their liabilities are losing in value. That's great. What happens for the system to implode is exactly the opposite. When the dollar goes up very rapidly, then it generally means that the emerging markets are suffering, business is lowering. So your cash flows are going down and your liabilities are going up in value when you need to service them. That's the problem. And that's the implosion that is more likely to happen. First, a stronger dollar sucks everything in, deleverages the system until an, basically a fragile point of disruption. And then we can think of an alternative. And this is the process. How long does it take? Nobody knows, to be honest. Do you think an implosion is inevitable? Yes. By the design of the system, Peter. Yeah, so that's exactly what everyone kind of says. But no one knows how long. Nobody knows how many bullets they have in their chamber, mm -hmm. how many times they can try. And, and what is an implosion? Is, you know, would you say that you would say that Venezuela imploded for sure? But would you say Turkey has imploded or is <laughs> going through very tough financial uh, situation? Uh, would you even say it Italy imploded or it is, uh, you know, what is an actual implosion? So like we can go. Yes. So look, yesterday we didn't implode, but today we did. Like, what is the measure? Mm. Do you see what I mean? It's a, yeah, it's yes, a tough one. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you. So I would say that when I look, there is no playbook for this simply because um, if you want to have a playbook, you should look at the last implosion of a global reserve currency. So that is the closest example in history you can get. There are a few problems that we are talking about a century ago, <laughs> right? And then we are talking about a completely different world with way less leverage, with way less globalization, way less um, interconnected. Now we're talking about the Brazilian corporate having, having dollar debt. Something like that didn't exist 100 years ago when you had the last episode of a global reserve currency imploding. So it is really hard to have a playbook for this thing, right? What I, what I see as an investor when I think about this is convexity. That's what I see. So I see something that has a payoff that can be extremely large and exponential. I don't know the timeline for this and nobody knows, to be honest. If somebody tells you they know, probably bullshit. Nobody knows. And that means that if I design a portfolio as an investor, I'm looking at the typical problem of, I know I want to spend some premium in my portfolio to have that payoff if something happens, because even if I spend a bit of premium, the payoff is so large that I'm going to be okay, at least in that environment. But I don't know when to spend it exactly, because in most cases I will be better off with other alternatives, okay? Now, Bitcoin is a very interesting asset from that perspective because it violates these rules that I just described. So what people used to do in the past, Peter, is the following. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me use gold. It's the easiest example, okay? Yeah, yeah. 
uh, I will have some gold in my portfolio because that's an option. Okay. So even better, I will have some options on gold because if the call options, if the price goes up, then the call options have embedded leverage, they will go up 20, 30, 50 times. Okay. So I can spend 1% of my portfolio in call options on gold, for example, and that will go up 50x. Or some people will say, fuck the call options, that's financialization. I want gold bars somewhere. But then I will have to have 5, 10% of my portfolio always allocated to gold for this reason. Okay. Nice. Problem. Problem. If you look at gold performance and stock market total return, so dividends plus price appreci appreci uh, appreciation, you will see that gold has massively underperformed stock total returns over the last well, a few decades, okay? And that makes sense simply because companies produce freaking earnings. They make money, okay? And as they make money, stock prices will go up. I mean, and they should go up faster than gold because they're more risky. So basic finance theory says you're buying a riskier asset which produces earnings, so a stock, and therefore over time, stocks will overperform gold. And that means that if you have allocated 10% of gold into your portfolio and your neighbor hasn't, your neighbor feels richer than you and you feel very stupid because your hedge has, an, has basically been suboptimal, okay? Mm -hmm. Now let's think about Bitcoin. Hey, that's an interesting asset, at least over the last few years eh, in, this, in this environment. So if 10 years ago, instead of doing 10% of gold, you would have done 1% of Bitcoin in your, in your portfolio, then you would have overperformed your neighbor. So you not only have an asset which potentially can play a role, a decent role into this implosion tipping point, which you don't know when it is, you don't know when it is, but it can play a role. But on top of it, over the last 10 years, it doesn't make you look stupid when you talk to your neighbors about your performance. Why do I say neighbor is because I always talk about the neighbor tracking error. So I've been approached by uh, investors to open a macro fund and they always ask like, what's going to be the target return? And I say, what's your neighbor's return? Because you're going to be asking him what has been his return and you want to look better than him. So just tell, tell him how much is his return. It's just a joke, but yeah. uh, it matters. In the psychology of people, they want to uh, perform better than a neighbor. They want to make sure they are uh, seen as smart investors, as a smart guy in the room. And, and Bitcoin has achieved two things over the last 10 years for investors. It has been an asset that provides you as a potential hedge against that convex breaking point. And it has also outperformed stocks in the same period. So I think mm -hmm. it's um, an interesting asset to consider in an asset allocation. You know I'm not a maximalist at all. I'm just yep. a guy that looks at the monetary system, has been lucky enough to work in a large bank, which means I've been in the trenches, literally doing these monetary transactions, repo, reverse repo, money at the bank, foreign debt borrowing, everything like that. So I have a decent point of view, let's say, of the, on this. Uh, but still, after everything considered, I think Bitcoin is an interesting asset to own in a portfolio because it provides you with that convexity. And at the same time, its price performance has been quite... Um, well, exponential, one should say, over the last 10 years. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Just, uh, just a bit of a segue onto Bitcoin and the circles you mix in and probably your online circles, offline circles of macro people. Have you seen a shift recently in uh, people's opinion of Bitcoin, um, with, especially with the launch of the ETFs? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of popularity around that. Uh, uh, yeah, one of the things that Bitcoiners, I think, like about the ETFs, it kind of gives us kind of validation. It kind of matures the uh, opinion of what Bitcoin is. Have you seen any change? Mm -hmm. So uh, let, me, let me put it like this. It makes it easier for some uh, clients, especially corporate treasurers, family offices. It makes it easier for them to allocate into Bitcoin part of their, of their portfolio because it's an ETF. And that might mm -hmm. sound pretty stupid, but it is the case because their mandate um, had to be modified before in order to you know, have an allocation to Bitcoin because it wasn't a financial instrument that was included in their mandate. And now it's an ETF. So yeah, you're buying an ETF, like you're buying ETFs for bonds or equities or commodities. You can also buy one for Bitcoin. So it actually facilitates 
some people to, uh, to consider an allocation. That has definitely been a change. Remember, now I'm talking about institutional people, but those are um, medium to low size institutional. So okay, I'm talking mm -hmm. about the mid size, low size family office here. I'm not talking about uh, Google Treasury going and buy Bitcoin. That's um, not yet happening, I would say. Um, but it definitely facilitates. It, uh, it gives it a little bit more of an institutional flavor, at least to the mid to low level institutional player. So it's a development that helps uh, the narrative of people that expect this large adoption. It helps a bit. But here again, I want to make sure that you know that the large institutional players and the regulators at the forefront of the current monetary system are doing everything they can not to have gold as a high liquid asset, not to have Bitcoin uh, as a regulatory friendly asset. That is still strongly the case today. It's the fight we're in. Okay, then secondly, um, so people are listening. We've got a lot of people listen who I think are more like me. They're like, uh, okay, uh, this, I like this macro elf guy. He sounds smart. Uh, I like his Italian accent. He, he makes terrible events sound funny, uh, but like, what the fuck is he actually doing? So you don't have to say exactly what you're doing, but what are the signals that you look for and how does that influence your kind of, I would say the best way, there's, there's two forms of like investment I, I think about. One is actual investment for, you know, ensuring that whatever capital I have grows, you know, it's, um, but secondly, it's like wealth preservation. Yeah. And I, I think of them both separately. Now with Bitcoin, I, I kind of get both, but outside people w won't just want to be all in Bitcoin, like maybe I or Danny would be. How do you think about that? Yeah. So what I'm trying to do here is design portfolios that are, or strategies and portfolios that are a mix of both. So what you want to try and achieve as an investor is to have a mix of assets that in normal times provides you with a good return. And what is mm -hmm. a good return? A good return is the inflation rate plus five to six percent that's a very good return because it yep. compounds over time to increase your real purchasing power over time which is what really matters okay so that's will be that will be a nominal return of uh, maybe around eight to ten percent that's that's a pretty good solid return and you want to be able to do that avoiding the drawdowns that are the scary ones that will lead you to make stupid decisions so mm -hmm. there is research that shows that people have double or triple the pain for a 20% drawdown against the, the joy they have from a 20% upside in their portfolio, which means that twice or triple the amount of pain or emotional intensity, let's say, will lead them most likely at around 20% to make stupid decisions. That is to liquidate their portfolio at the lows, to you know get out of the market, to preserve their wealth, which basically means crystallizing their losses at one of the most possible of the worst possible times, right? So the portfolios I design try to stay away from that risk, to limit the drawdown as well through a good use of diversification. In other words, wealth preservation is part of it because when I say I want to deliver inflation plus X Y Z percent, it means you have to have assets that preserve your wealth as well. So they preserve your purchasing power over time, okay? That's one of the backbones of, of the portfolios I am building. And um, as I was saying before, uh, I've been, uh, I mean, I, I've been recently approached by investors asking me to, well, I'm gonna say this, come on, literally start a macro fund, uh, which is, you know, I've been um, in the business of running money for, eight years between 2013 and 2021. And then I left the bank and started the Macro Compass, which is my macro strategy firm. So I do research, uh, model portfolios. Mm -hmm. I have hedge funds as clients, but you know, at some point I want to be back into the game of running money. You know, I'm an investor <laughs> after all, and I've been asked to do that. So I am now working towards, uh, making that a reality and it's, you know, it's happening. What's the Bitcoin allocation in that? <laughs> I'm not going to disclose that publicly, but let's say I, what I will be saying is that as a macro investor, I will be looking at Bitcoin as I always do as a macro asset class. It's a macro asset class with particular properties, which are quite interesting and unique if I think about it. And we just talked about them before, right? The fact that it mm -hmm. can provide you with decent, more than decent returns while effectively you wait 
for that potentially convex period to kick on, it's, it's quite interesting, you know, and, and I think it deserves particular attention as a potential macro asset class. One of my best clients, he's a macro investor, um, a true one. So that means he will buy foreign currencies, foreign assets, and then go long one equity sector, short the other equity sector. But he, in early 2019, I think allocated three to 5% of its portfolio to Bitcoin, and that went 10x, which for him is a great return given his risk parameters. So you can be a macro investor and still see Bitcoin uh, through the lenses of a macro asset class. And I think that that works pretty well. Yeah, interesting. So we um, we booked this to talk to you about China, and we've done an hour. But so I think we're going to save that. We're probably going to try and book you again and do the China thing another time. But there is one other thing we did want to talk to you about, which is NVIDIA, oh. AI. Like, is it a bubble? Me and Danny were talking about this beforehand, and I, I was explaining to Danny, I worked in the Bitcoin, bu um, Bitcoin bubble. Sorry, I worked in the dot-com bubble, mm -hmm. and there were companies raising a huge amount of money based on flimsy ideas yeah. where they didn't actually understand the technology. They didn't, and there wasn't the customer base to support the amount of revenue they needed to generate to, to justify the investments. Danny rightly brings up pets.com. I brought up boo.com. Um, I do see a, see a slight difference in what's happening in the AI market in that I have a subscription to ChatGPT and MidJourney. I use most of them nearly daily. I know they're signing up millions, if not tens of millions of users. But they might be two success stories outside of everything else. But either way, what I do know is, and especially our sponsor, Iris, they're, they're not just mining Bitcoin. They've also got the, um, they're also doing the data centers for AI. I know it's very, very intensive. There's an intensive demand on processing power to generate these AI answers. So I, I'm, I'm coming in to ask you about it saying, I don't f I feel the setup is very different to the uh, dot com boom of the nineties. Yeah, I mean, the first thing you need to know, I mean, you know that already, but people need to understand is that Nvidia's free cash flows, which is basically a measure of their profitability as a company, keeps growing very rapidly, which is not a thing you saw during the dot com bubble. I mean, these companies weren't making any money. Basically, they were losing money on a quarter on quarter basis. And Nvidia is not. Media is making money. It's a profitable company with very, 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 very big margins. Big material difference, right? That one. Mm. Uh, of course, there is a couple of caveats. They're doing that right now with such margins, but ultimately competitors will catch up to a certain extent that will reduce their margins to a certain extent, right? So the numbers you're seeing today on profitability, you can't really extrapolate them forever, but that doesn't mean that media is a bubble or will not be a profitable company going forward. Um, then there is the other question is, uh, what about the price? Should I buy media? And no, that's a different story, I think, because yeah. what you're doing right here, right now, is not looking at fundamentals or a narrative or a story anymore. You're looking at explosive upside momentum driven price action. Okay. So there is a famous chart doing the rounds where you can show the Cisco 1999 chart parabolic upward move and you can almost overlay one on one Nvidia chart and people say, okay, this is going to end up in tears. And look, we've seen Tesla doing this kind of moves in the past as well. Okay. And at that point, it doesn't become a, an investment anymore. You're trading momentum. That's what you're doing. Yeah, so are you, value. are you able to identify exhaustion moves and et cetera? It's literally a trend momentum trade. That's what it is today. So unless you're a momentum trader, I would recommend you simply stay out of it. But it is very hard for people because of the neighbor tracking error. If the neighbor has media, they implicitly feel they're short media. And they are not. They just don't have it. They're flat. But the neighbor tracking error is a true thing, Peter. I mean, people will say, he has it. I don't. I'll have to go and buy Nvidia, which is ridic it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, d I don't feel like Nvidia is a bubble. It could be overpriced. But but to me, the, the bubble, you would see something you know, perhaps implode. I don't see NVIDIA imploding. I can see people buying the top, um, but that that doesn't worry me. Uh, anything else you want to ask, Danny? I mean, I, apart from not getting into the China stuff, I feel like we've, we've done pretty well there. 
Yeah, well, that was like, it was funny when we were preparing. Danny had this uh, intro question. It was um, just like a broad, like macro question. I said, "Yeah, let's not do that, you know, because this show is going to be about China, and uh, we, there's no point in getting distracted distracted for the first 10, 15 minutes, and then bang, you just hit us with so much gold." I was like, "No, we need to keep pulling on this, and pulling on this, and pulling on this." I had pre- I- guys, I had prepared a bunch of notes looking at the population growth in China, private debt, and state-owned <laughs> enterprises, and it's sitting there. I'm like, "What the hell? We talk." all about everything but not china but you know i had a lot of fun so why not can we book it can we rebook you again very soon to do that china one because sure. it just feels like a completely different show yeah i'd be very happy to do that absolutely yeah um i mean this was great where do you want to send people how, how do we help you oh yeah it's very kind of you so what i would say now is the following um i am working to open my own macro fund okay so the fund is not going to be open to large institutional allocators on purpose. What I'm doing is I'm looking at a world with a lot of macro volatility over the next 10 years, where bond market opportunities, but global macro opportunities will be abundant, I think, because of the use of fiscal and everything we talked about before. So I think there will be a lot of opportunities down the road. And I'm opening an early window, let's say, for normal people that want to you know, try and discuss with me a potential allocation to the macro fund. So if you are one of these and you want to have a chat, you can just send me an email, fund at themacrocompass.com. Or you can just go on any social media, ping me up, my messages are open, and we can chat about it. Amazing. Um, I love this. I, it's a, it remind, you remind me of Giacomo, which is like a really easy, of, uh, easy obvious comparison because he's also Italian. <laughs> and I don't maybe it's all Italians, but you just have a way of delivering... Uh, uh, depressing information in a really entertaining way. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. I mean, it's always fun. We, we were supposed to do this live in London, I think. We tried. No. Uh, because of uh, capital raising, I'm often in London as well. So next time I am, I'm going to send you a message and uh, see if Please you, do. Yeah, and, and then we'll, we can have we'll some gra- we'll, Yeah, we'll grab dinner as well. But, uh, mate, I always love chatting to you. Uh, I, I learned so much from you, so I appreciate your time. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hook up again soon to do the China stuff. Yeah, definitely. I also want to see a, a match of your team, by the way. I see those yes. amazing shirts and stuff. I really want to see a match. We will get you to one. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, man. Thank you.